take a look at some things. Do a sound check. Testing. Testing. All right. All right, look like we got some sound here for a change. All right, all right, all right. So since we are live, we're going to go ahead and get this conversation started. All right, so um, I was thinking about this. I I'm just going to go ahead and get started. And so as you come into the live, please, TJ Love Sports, Sanjeet, salute, salute, Sanjeet, we about to get into it, man. We about to get into it. So there was a, um, there was an interview that was done with uh, Charles Oakley. Uh, let me see what you got. You said boxing and basketball were, were, were so much better back in the day. Peace and blessing 74. Same to you, man. Same to you. So, so yeah, so Charles Oakley did this interview. So Charles Oakley, man, uh, if you got, uh, no, of course, we, 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 we're older guys. And so we know exactly who Charles Oakley is. Charles Oakley, uh, he was with the Chicago Bulls at first, and he was an enforcer for Michael Jordan. So when Michael Jordan first came into the NBA, Charles Oakley was was a forward, and 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 man, Charles Oakley. When you look at him underneath that jersey, man, Charles Oakley was jacked. But Charles Oakley had, had always had a very tough reputation. You know, he was an enforcer. And when he went to the Knicks and you had Charles Oakley, Patrick Ewan, Anthony Mason, Larry Johnson, man, them dudes, boy. Woo! Like, that shows how good the Bulls and Michael Jordan were because all, almost every finals, like, it was the New York Knicks. It was the New York Knicks, John Starks, those guys. But Charles Oakley was tough. Charles Oakley used to punk Scottie Pippen when Scottie Pippen was a rookie. Like, you will see old videos of him grabbing Scottie Pippen by the back of the neck, and Scottie Pippen was all cringing, and he was intimidated by Charles Oakley. Charles Oakley was a real tough dude. And Charles Oakley, he's still a tough dude. You know, i seen Charles Oakley get into it with some people uh, you know, in, in the stands. But Charles Oakley was, uh, he was working as an NBA coach. And, and of course, Charles Oakley is no longer working as an NBA coach. And one of the reasons why he's no longer working as an NBA coach is because, you know, he, he has some things to say about the NBA, about NBA players today. And the things that he said about NBA players, like, it reminded me of boxers today. And so let's go ahead and get into those things. And, and, and I'm going to also bring in some other conversations that other uh, former NBA players, such as Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett, has said regarding today's NBA 
and why today's NBA, why the quality of the game is so bad. And then I'm going to compare it to today's boxing. Let me see what you say. I'm 42 and the 80s and 90s era is definitely my favorite era. The same with boxing. Yeah, absolutely. So Charles Oakley said, man, when he was coach, when, when he was a coach, Sanjeet says, I'm 29, and I agree, 80s and 90s were better. Oh, my gosh, you're 29, dude? Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. Man. Man, my oldest kid's your age. <laughs> um, so... In the in the uh, 80s, I mean, so so in boxing, I mean, I mean, so Charles Oakley, he stated that these players, they get paid a lot today. OK, so that's one of the first things. It's like these you hear about these contracts that these players are getting, but you also hear about you also hear about the deals that a lot of these boxers get today and. A lot of these boxers, man, you know, they make a ridiculous amount of money. So, um, but with all of this money that they get paid, here's what Charles Oakley had to say. He said, as a coach, these guys come in. Well, well let, let me mention the first thing, one of the first things, first couple of things. And then we'll just, we'll kind of go from there. It says, been watching 74 since 2015. Those boxing videos you made were gold. Thank you, man. But so I was looking at, um, I was looking at something and I can't recall one of the first European players I ever remember winning an MVP award wasn't wasn't it like Dirk Nowitzki? It was either Dirk Nowitzki or Steve Nash, because I know Steve Nash is Canadian. So those were the only non-American players I can recall winning an MVP. F first winning an MVP. Prior to that, there, you know, it, it was mainly American players. In addition to that, and so you have the same thing in boxing. You have this, you have like this Eastern European invasion in boxing where guys like Alexander Usyk was cruiserweight champion and now he's heavyweight champion, okay? Now, of course, you did have the Klitschko's, you did have Sultan Abramovich. You did have those guys back in the day. But, man, for the most part, you know, um, you know, boxing was, you know, it was it was dominated by, you know, Americans, you know, for a long time. You got Gennady Golovkin. You have Vasil Lomachenko. You have a lot of Eastern European boxers. Um, as well as Asian boxers such as um, such as uh, Inoue uh, or Inoue. You, you, you also have those guys today when at first that wasn't the case. So and, and so you have the same thing in the NBA. The NBA is pretty much being dominated by European slash Eastern European players. So you you have like you you have guys like Giannis Antetokounmpo, who's from Greece. You have guys such as you know, uh, you, you have guys such as Joker. Uh, you know, you have guys. Um, I forgot number seventy seven for the Dallas Mavericks, um, but it, it's being dominated by them. You know, and, and, and American players, American players are just an embarrassment today. And the NBA, Adam Silver, yeah, Luka Doncic, yeah. But 
the NBA claims that they changed the game to make it easier for people like Steph Curry to score. So in other words, Adam Silver knows that if Steph Curry was playing under the previous rules of the NBA, that Steph Curry wouldn't have near the success that he has today. But another reason why Adam Silver, Adam Silver, in my opinion, changed the game for, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, and, and, and this is the same issue in boxing. And this is going to go back to something Charles Oakley said. So, so let, let me go ahead and say that. Charles Oakley had mentioned that players today, as much as they get paid, they're lazy. They don't want to work on their craft. Charles Oakley tells these guys, to, like, stop working on your jumpers. Stop working on your dribbling. You already know how to shoot. You already know how to dribble. Why don't you start working on post moves? Why don't you start working on backing people up to the goal, getting them to the paint, and do more high, do do shots that are more higher percentage. Do shots that where you are more likely to hit it because you're closer to the basket. But those guys don't want to do those things. They don't want to work on that skill set. You know, and so they're lazy. And so what do you have today? Today you have people like Mark Breland talking about Deontay Wilder, saying that Deontay Wilder don't want to do road work, that Deontay Wilder don't want to work on certain skills. Very good point with the new rule change in the NBA. Hand defense is, is pretty much non-existent in today's NBA. It was much harder back in the day for players to go to the basket. So many three-pointers, now it's insane. Exactly. And so, so here's the thing. Ball handling actually didn't improve. Ball handling actually got worse. Because when it comes to ball handling, what everybody is saying today is that these players, some of the some of these guys like Kyrie Irving, Steph Curry, all of these guys who who are recognized as the best ball handlers in the league, Ja Morant, all of these guys who are recognized as some of the best ball handlers in the league, they are actually carrying the ball, and the, the, they also, you know, they there there is a carrying compilation and there's a travel compilation of LeBron James. I saw LeBron James. I saw him dribbling the ball. He was carry he was carrying the ball and then in addition to carrying the ball, he lost control of the ball. Had the ball because he was dribbling with the ball under his hands like this. He was carrying the ball and actually caught the ball, cuffed the ball. On his, on his stomach, regained control of the ball, took a couple of steps, which was a travel. And then, like, tried to shoot a layup, tr but somehow drew a foul and didn't get called for it. And so then, in addition to that, there's a flopping compilation with LeBron James. There's a flopping compilation. You know, LeBron actually has a lot to do with why today's NBA is so bad. Um, LeBron James, man, um, and, and we'll, we'll get back to that. But Charles Oakley also mentioned, he, he, he also mentioned that, um, th th he said they're lazy, they don't want to work on their skill set, but then they don't want to work on actual defense. They don't want to, they don't want the game to be physical anymore. The game, the game's not physical anymore. And the one thing about the one concern people had for players coming out of high school and going into the NBA, the one concern that that you typically had for a player coming out of college, there's freshman, sophomore year, trying to enter into the NBA draft is that your body, you, you need to stay in school for a little bit so that your body can get developed. Now, of course, the concern was that, well, 
We're concerned that they're going to get injured while they're in school, while they're in college. We're concerned that they're going to get injured and they're not, you know, and this going to affect their draft status. But that turned out to be kind of a myth. With NBA players today, with these NBA players today, they're coming out of school their freshman year, pretty much. Freshman, sophomore year, you rarely see a, 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 an American player come out of college, turn and pro after their junior, senior year. Most of these guys, they go to college for the sole purpose of entering into the NBA. You know, like they they have they have no they have no ambition to f- remember with remember the way players used to be was that I want to fall back on my education. Now you don't have that anymore. Now, now of course, a lot of these players they, they weren't majoring in anything great, but a lot of these players were like Michael Jordan. His his major, his major was cultural ge- ge- geography. That was his major, but you know that was his major, and he made it all the way up to his junior year. And if I'm not mistaken, I want to say Michael Jordan actually graduated. But then even Shaquille O'Neal, Shaquille O'Neal went to LSU, left LSU, and Shaquille O'Neal actually ended up getting additional co- college degrees. You says, in my opinion, I believe that even if a player w- were to get hurt in college, it's part of the game. Uh, it'll toughen you up almost like a rites of passage of sorts. Th- that's a good point. But another thing, another thing to keep in mind that what the concern was, the reason why players, you, you stayed in college for a couple of different reasons. First of all, you stay in college so that you can be exposed to different players. You can be exposed to different coaching. But then also you gave your time, you gave your body the opportunity to develop because you in college, you got you you got physical, you, you got trainers. And basically, you know, these trainers that you would get there would be a professor there would be some type of professional like no so so when i went to school uh i didn't finish school but but my major was exercise science and so you would have an exercise scientist you would have a phys- you know you would have an exercise scientist who would come up with workouts for you know specific to the to the sport that athlete played in you says uh vince carter went back to and got his degree yep it's a very smart events to go back and complete his studies exactly and and so what you would have though is that you would have an exercise scientist the exercise scientist will write the exercise plan for the athletes and so you have what's called specificity training And so specificity training is where you are training the muscles, you know, specific to that sport or to that activity. Uh, So so you you have so so very, very similar to I I, want to say very well, I ain't going to say similar to occupational therapist. It's not an exercise scientist. You kind of specifically work with sports teams, but then you have you know so then the exercise scientists you have people that that are in the program trying to get a degree and they're working under that exercise scientist in addition to the exercise scientist you may have someone there that that majors in physical therapy so if you have a player that gets injured you will have a phys- you will have a physical therapist you know, who's part of, you know, who's working with the team and you will have physical therapy majors that that are able to go to that, go and work with that college team and any injured player, they they will work with them. They will work with them. And and, uh, and 
that will also be part of like kind of like on the job training, you know, and, and they and so when they go in, when they go into the real world and, and they and they can put that on their resume that like, yeah, you know, I went to the University of North Carolina. I was an exercise. I was an exercise science major and I was working with the exercise scientists for the Tar Heels and I was working with the football team and so stuff like that. And so when, when a person is going to college, when a person is going to college, you really went there because it was understood that the NBA and the NFL is much harder than even even like high level division one NCAA. So so the NBA is way tougher and way more physical than the Big Ten, the ACC, the SEC. It's, it's much more physical. The guys are much better. I mean, you're talking about like, even for Division One, you even even Division One players, less than 1% of those players making it to the NBA. That's how tough it is to make it to the NBA. And so you for you to make it to the NBA, you got to be really good. And so you so with these players and, and so it's the same and, and so then these NBA play, th- these collegiate players you got to remember internationally our collegiate players played against their professional players and most of the time the majority of the time with the exception of 1988 and what was it, 1972 or whatever, we were beating them. We were getting gold medals. Those were the only two Olympics where, where our collegiate players were not getting goals. It was the only time. Most of the time, even our collegiate players were beating their pro players. But then, and, and so... You look back at us as far as the Olympics were concerned. The United States were cold in the Olympics. We we had a very good Olympic boxing team. And we had numerous of gold medalists who, you know, like Floyd Patterson was a gold medalist in the middleweight division. Joe Frazier was a gold medalist. Ali was a gold medalist. We, we had numerous gold medalists who participated, you know, in the Olympics in boxing. And now today, boxers don't want to do that no more. American boxers, they don't want to go to and represent the United States in the Olympics no more. They they want to go straight to the pros. And, and so we know that when a boxer, when you skip the Olympics, it does a couple of things for you. It, it hurts It hurts you as far as getting a, a really good contract with a promoter, you know, a, a, along with a signing bonus, but it also hurts your experience. So, so, so it takes you a longer time. You, you got to compensate. You have to make up in the pros what you what you didn't do in the amateurs so if 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 you fall high level in the amateurs when you turn pro you pretty much you you pretty much are on the fast track to get a world title i remember evander holyfield fought for a world title like his 11th 12th professional fight you know uh, Floyd Mayweather fought for a world title like his 17th, 18th professional fight. Fernando Vargas, it was like his 11th, it was like his 12th, 13th fight. David Reed, it, you know, he fought for a world title real early. Oscar De La Hoya fought for a world title early. And it was because these guys, they, they competed at such a high level in terms of the amateurs. Anthony Joshua, Anthony Joshua, it was like his 17th, 18th fight when he fought for a world title. And so, but but Deontay Wilder, look how long it took Deontay Wilder to finally fight for a world title. Look how, look how long it took Errol Spence. 
Look how long it took Keith Thurman. These dudes have been fighting for years so they were finally ready to fight for a world title. Sanjeet says, very good point, 74. I go to, to University of Niagara Falls in Canada, and my university isn't even known for basketball, yet and still my university's basketball team would beat me with ease. Yeah, and said, thus, NBA is extremely tough for players to get in. Well, let me say this. It's not, it's not that tough. It's not, as, it's not nearly as tough as it used to be. And, and 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 especially and you got to remember man guys like Michael Jordan guys like Michael Jordan he was coached by Dean Smith he was coached by Bobby Knight in the Olympics um he was coached by Doug Collins. He was coached coached by this other dude. Then he was coached by Phil Jackson. Uh, you know, like Michael Jordan, and then and then he was coached by Chuck Daly in the Olymp in the '92 Olympics. Michael Jordan, and, and then there was the, all these assistant coaches. Michael Jordan had been exposed to a lot of coaching. Larry Bird had been ex exposed to a lot of coaching. You know, he was exposed to Casey Jones. He was exposed to a lot of coaching. Irvin Magic Johnson was exposed to a lot of coaching. You know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, John Wooden, one of the you no know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, collegiate coach of all time, Coach Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at UCLA. And let me tell you about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, here's a story for you guys. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The North Carolina Bruins, the, 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 I mean, the, the UCLA Bruins, they were multiple time NCAA national champions. John Wooden had this rule that if you were a freshman, you, you were not going to start. You had to wait till your sophomore year. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's freshman team played the national championship team beat the national championship team in a scrimmage by 50 points. Kareem still didn't start. That's something to think about. That's something to think about. John Thompson. Yeah, John Thompson coached Alonzo Mourning. Coach, uh, Coach Allen Iverson, you know, like th these go these guys were exposed to great coaching. That's why these dudes were great players. You know, Akeem Olajuwon, you know, like wasn't he part of the Fa Slamma Jamma? So thanks for giving us the 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 insights of Kareem, man. I really miss the skyhook, which he would see. And that's the thing. That's the that's the thing, Sanji. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was just like, man, the skyhook is such a simple move. It's such a simple move. It's not that hard. But you do have to go in the trenches to be able to use the skyhook. And players today just don't want to do it. Guys today just don't want to do it. That's the problem. But the skyhook is a, is a highly effective shot. Very effective shot. But you says Coach K and his program and Gene Key, yep, Purdue, uh, Denny Crum. Oh, yeah. Yep. You had, what was it, Digger Phelps? You had Digger Phelps. And then I forgot the name of the coach at Georgia Tech. But, man, I mean, it, it was just it was just some great, it was some great coaches. You know, like I said, Bobby Knight. Uh, you know, Donovan at the University of Florida. I mean, there, there was some great, great coaches. There were some great coaches. Um, what was the coach uh, at NC State that died of cancer? So you, you had that coach. I mean, it, 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 was, it was some great coaching. It was some great coaching back in the day. Really good coaching. And you just, you just, you had these, um, yeah, Lou Olson. 
uh, oh, Cheney at Temple. And then what was the name of the black coach at, at Arkansas? Oh, my gosh. He was Nolan Richardson. Oh, my goodness. Nolan Richardson was a beast. Nolan Richardson. But that's the thing, though, man. It's like we – those coaches and then even – you you have old school NBA players who could who could be coaches. Remember Larry Bird and Isaiah Thomas were coaches. They can't be coaches today because these guys aren't coachable. There's no definitive position today in the NBA. Pat Riley can't coach today's NBA. You know, like there there there's no definitive. There's no definitive. Remember, remember Jerry Tarkanian at UNLV, but there's no definitive coaching in, uh, I mean, no definitive position in the NBA. Every player plays the same. You know, it's, it's like every player plays the same. That like like everybody wants to handle the ball. Everybody wants to shoot threes. No one wants to get into the paint. Rebounds are rebounds. People get rebounds based on opportunities. And so in order for you to get a rebound, in order for you to get rebounds, like guys, um, yeah, shark, talk, talk the shark. Exactly. Daryl Henderson. What's up, brother? So, so yeah, man. And so it's the same thing in boxing today. Emmanuel Stewart can't coach today's boxers. You know, um, <clears throat> I was going to say Kevin Rooney. You say I'm feeling real good right now. Kevin Rooney, Teddy Atlas, Eddie Futch, um, I'm sorry, man. Um, someone. But someone, someone like Eddie Futch, someone like Ray Arcel, um, so someone like Angelo Dundee, those guys, uh, they can't coach today's boxers. Nineties college basketball was the last of of that. Really, two K was Calipari, all oh, Calipari and Rick Pitino. Those dudes, the, the, that, that was some real coaches right there, man. And like I said, those coaches, in my opinion, they they can't coach. They can't coach today's collegiate players. They can't coach today's NBA players. And and, and honestly, the the name the name image likeness thing, it's like that makes players even more uncoachable. George Benton. Yeah, you, you just, you you can't. I'm sorry, let me see what this person want, man.
George Benton, though, man. George Benton. George Benton, man, was yeah, they they definitely wouldn't be able to handle him. George Benton, he 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 trained, um, he trained, then he he I know he trained Holyfield when Holyfield fought Douglas. Um he trained Holyfield when Holyfield fought Douglas. And then he trained Mike. I know Emmanuel Stewart trained Mike McCallum, but didn't he train him for a little bit too? No, 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 no. Yeah, he did train Mike McCallum. He trained Mike McCallum. I know he trained Pernell Whitaker. And I think he trained Meldrick Taylor too. But. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But. As I as I think about it, man, um, as I think about and, and the reason the, the the reason why the reason why these box and, and that's why today's box boxers, they're not reaching out to old school boxers, you know, like. So so like, for instance. Remember. There was some old school boxers reaching out to Deontay Wilder. You know, actually, Lennox Lewis offered to mentor Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua didn't want Lennox Lewis around him. You know, he didn't he didn't want Lennox Lewis mentoring him. Deontay Wilder, whatever happened with Deontay Wilder being mentored by by uh, Lennox Lewis? I mean, you can learn so much, but some, sometimes, man these dudes trainers and then I, I remember Tim Witherspoon Tim Witherspoon was reaching out to some of these boxers man you know how much like Tim Witherspoon was a two time world champion and Tim with like Tim Witherspoon's era of boxing was pretty tough dude he had a pretty tough era man and and dudes didn't want to be dudes didn't want to be trained by Tim Witherspoon and I, I, I think I think that's just a shame. It's it's a lot of boxers. It's a lot of boxers. A lot of old school boxers you can learn so much from. And um <laughs> you said any thoughts on Mike Tyson versus the YouTuber? No, it's 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 absolutely a money grab. Yeah, it's it's absolutely a money grab. Yeah. And I, I don't think and and my concern is Mike Tyson, you know, getting severely injured from that fight. So I, I don't think that's a good fight for Tyson. I don't think Tyson should be fighting uh, Logan Paul. I mean, Jake Paul. I don't think that should be happening. I think Tyson should just stay, stay retired. Because it's like, you know... It, at at that age, man, you know, your 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 coordination isn't there either. You know, your coordination isn't there. And then your body is wearing down, man. And, and so it, it's so much harder to recover, especially from getting hurt. And it's hard enough when you're young and you have you have a brain injury uh, you know, and, and recovering from a brain injury. I, I, I can't even imagine how much tougher it is for a nearly 60 year old man to recover from a traumatic brain injury. So I do not like, just like with Evander Holyfield, man, when he fought Vitor Belfer, it's like, why? Like, why, why would you fight? And, and then like Vitor Belfort, why would Vitor Belfort, agree to fight Holyfield, you know? Um, yeah, man, it's like, you don't want to see these dudes go down, go out like that, man. And, and, you know, and if, if I, if I'm Jake Paul, to me, man, like not all money is good money. I mean, it's, it's a bunch. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, man, a few years ago, you know, uh, I was, you know, I was, I was exclude. I was doing photography exclusively. You know, I was just doing photography and, um, I was helping this dude with 
promoting his barbershop. I was helping this dude do some ads for his barbershop. And, um, and there was this lady who was like, you know, I want, I want to hire you to take pictures for me. And I was like, cool. I was like, uh, I was like, so what am I taking pictures of? She's like my girls. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, how old are your girls? She was just like, you don't understand. She was like, I got some girls I want you to take some pictures of. I was like, okay. And so I was just like, like, what girls are you talking about? Come to find out, man, this chick ran an escort service and she wanted me to take pictures of her escorts. And I was just like, nah, I ain't doing that. And so she she was just like, so what, you don't want to make no money? And I'm just, I'm just like, you know, I'm like, all money ain't good money. You know, it's like, like, and it's, it's a whole bunch of times, whole, whole bunch of different times. I could have made a lot of money and, uh, and, and I was just like, no, nah, we not doing that. You know? And I, I was like, no, nah, we not doing that because it's like, not, not all money is good money, man. It's like, um, yeah, man, it's like not all money is good money, you know? And so, uh, you know, th- there'll be some people, you no. Know, that that's why you know you have these people man that sell their souls man and you know they sell their souls and you know for for money you know like right now what's out there now uh what's out there now about sean combs meek mill and a lot of these other rappers man look at what sean combs was doing to these dudes allegedly look what he was alleged of doing to these people you know these these were people who were just trying to make money and in order for them to make money, Sean Combs had them doing, you know, allegedly had them doing this stuff, man. It's like, not all money is good money. And, and, and these dudes are doing this stuff for opportunities. Now it's one thing. It's one thing you have me walk across the town to get you a cheesecake. That's one thing, but it's another thing that you have me doing something else, you know, to get to, just just so I can have a record deal, just so I can just so I can make make a little money. Not all money is good money, you know, because it's like like I can just imagine, man. I, I mean, I can imagine. I can imagine. You says that could have been some some undercover. Glad you turned that down. <laughs> yeah, not all money is good money. So, so another thing, a- another thing is that guys don't want to be they they don't they don't want to compete. So that's another thing Charles Oakley was saying. He's saying that these dudes don't want to compete. One of the things that Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce were saying and a few other people, you know, they were talking about the influence that LeBron James had with the All-Star game. And remember in the All-Star game, you had the three-point contest, you had the slam dunk contest. And what would happen? You know, the 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 top the top basketball players Michael Jordan, Dominique Wilkins, Dr. J, uh, you had Vince Carter, you had Kobe Bryant, you had, uh, uh, what was it, Quentin Richardson or whatever. You had some of the top players in the NBA. They were competing in the slam dunk contest. You know, and, uh, you know, guys like D minor and, I mean, I mean, Harold Miner, you, you had top guys competing in a slam dunk contest. Tracy McGrady, Vince Carter, you know, uh, Steve Francis. And, and the thing was, y- you know, you didn't win. You know, there was times that you didn't win. There was times that you got you. You may have gotten eliminated in the first round, but that was fine, though. That was fine. I mean, it was. Like there was so much enjoyment with the slam dunk contest. Now 
because LeBron, LeBron does d- d- goes in the layup lines and he does these dunks, but then LeBron won't participate in the slam dunk contest. And what it did was that it set a standard, it set a precedent for all of the other for all of the other top players like Giannis, all of these other top players to not participate in the slam dunk contest. It it got people like Ja Morant not to participate in the slam dunk contest. It got people like Zion Williamson not to participate in the slam dunk contest because these dudes are scared of scared of losing. Now, here's another thing. Speaking of scared of losing, let's get to the big thing. Let's get to the big thing. You have players in the NBA They want in order in order for them, they feel that in order for them to win a championship, they have to be gift wrapped an NBA title. In other words, they have to go to a super team. Who started all that? LeBron started all that. LeBron started all that in 2010 when he left the Cleveland Cleveland Cavaliers and went to Miami. What do you have today in boxing? Today in boxing, you have guys just like just like LeBron James, just like Kawhi Leonard, just like uh, Kevin Durant, just like uh, Russell Westbrook, just like uh, James Harden. These guys jump from team to team to team to team trying to get on super teams so that they can win titles. That's that's what they're doing today. You have guys today in boxing. They jump from weight class to weight class to weight class to weight class simply because there's an opportunity there to to become a world champion. Do you notice how how unorganic, if that's a word, do you notice how unorganic it is? When a, when a fighter becomes a world champion today, do you see how unorganic it is when a person becomes a unified world champion? You see how how it really doesn't mean it, it, it really doesn't have the same ring to it when a play when, when a fighter becomes an undisputed champion. Terrence Crawford is a two time undisputed champion, but it, it was they were weak. They were weak. When Evander, look at who Evander Holyfield beat to become undisputed at cruiserweight. Look at who Evander Holyfield beat to become undisputed at heavyweight. Look at who Lennox Lewis beat to become undisputed. Look at who Pernell Whitaker beat. It, it like you had fighters that didn't become undisputed. They just simply became unified world champions. But it, it, it was it was so much more meaningful than a guy today becoming undisputed. When Felix Trinidad beat Oscar De La Hoya to be the IBF and what the WBC World Welterweight Champion. It, it meant even more than what when Terrence Crawford became undisputed at Walter Wade. Whose undisputed run was 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 of greater significance? Terrence Crawford at 140 and at 147. What's up, Kendrick Taylor? So I got a question for you guys, for you boxing experts. Which undisputed was more meaningful? And 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 I'll give Terrence Crawford both weight classes. Terrence Crawford at 140 and 147 becoming a two-time undisputed world champion or Bernard Hopkins at 160. Who was more meaningful? Terrence Crawford at 140 and at 147 or Lennox Lewis at heavyweight? Which one was more significant? 
Which one was more significant? Devin Haney becoming undisputed at 135 or Floyd Mayweather becoming unified at 147. Like, like, look, look at what, look at the gauntlet Floyd went through at 147 versus what Devin Haney went through. And the reason why Floyd didn't become undisputed at 147 was because Eddie Hearn didn't want Kell Brook fighting Floyd. But you, you, you look at it and you, you look at it, man, and. Yeah, it's, it's like you look at it and, and these dudes, man, it just it just it just don't have the same ring to it. It just it 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 doesn't mean the same. So it, so so then so then you look at you look at today's NBA. You look at today's NBA. What was what was more significant? Was it more significant that the Golden State Warriors went 73 and 9 or the Bulls went 72 and 10. Which one? You know, like which which one was more significant? LeBron winning his first NBA title at Miami or Jordan winning his first NBA title you know, when, when the Bulls beat the Lakers, it was like, which one is more, more relevant? Which one was more significant? Jordan didn't have a super team. Jordan, Jordan, dude, it took a while before Scottie Pippen even became an all-star. Jordan, for most of his career, didn't play with all-stars. And then people always mention Dennis Rodman. It's like, bro, Dennis Rodman was like 37, 38 years old when he played for the Bulls. You know, so he was old when he played for the Bulls. The Bulls had the oldest team in the NBA. Then, of course... Then, of course, you, you have these guys, just like in the NBA, with LeBron James. LeBron James is going to these different teams, and he's padding his stats. You have boxers today who are not trying to be competitive. They're not – they're they, they, they have – completely unproductive careers, the only thing that they're doing is padding their stats. Adrian Broner, Javante Tank Davis, Shakur Stevenson. Like, these guys, you wouldn't, like, you look at Adrian Broner, it's hard to believe that Adrian Broner, like, the same generation that brags about Terrence Crawford and brags about Vasil Lomachenko, you got to also brag about Adrian Broner. I think it's hypocritical for people to brag about Terrence Crawford and brag about Vasil Lomachenko, brag about Shakur Stevenson, that these people became world champions in multiple weight classes, but you're not gonna. So you're not gonna brag about Adrian Broner either. Adrian Broner is a four division world champion. You gonna brag about Javante Tank Davis, but you're not gonna brag about Adrian Broner. These dudes are hot, like just like LeBron hopped from team to team to team. Yeah, but I mean, it's a good point too. Too bad he didn't take boxing serious, but man, a lot of these dudes, a lot of these dudes don't really take boxing serious. And, and like, I'm gonna tell you, man, I can tell by looking at these fighters, I can tell you about the holes in their game. 
I could tell, like, man, these this person has so many holes in their game. This is why they're not trying to fight this guy right here. Javante Tank Davis has so many holes in this game. There's a reason why Javante Tank Davis didn't want to fight Lomachenko. It's a reason. Like, Dev, uh, Javante Tank Davis just didn't duck Devin Haney. That's what people don't realize. He didn't just duck Devin Haney at 135. There was Vasil Lomachenko. There was Teofimo Lopez. There was George Cambosis. And there was Devin Haney. There was four people he didn't fight at 135. There was four people at 135 he didn't fight. And then he could have easily gone up to 140 and fought Regis. This dude, this dude will say a world, a world title being champion isn't important to me, but he'll hold on to an irrelevant world title. He'll he'll hold on to an irrelevant world title, and and then people will echo that saying, it's like, well, "Well, world titles aren't important, you know." World, so so, and it's, it's the same. People say the same thing about LeBron. It's like, well. If if world title if if NBA titles isn't isn't important to LeBron, why do LeBron keep hopping to teams just so he can win a title? LeBron James, man, like ever since 2010, LeBron James hops from team to team to team so that he can win a world so that he can win an NBA t- championship. LeBron James is incapable of carrying a team on his back and winning a title. He's incapable of doing it. He goes from team to team to team trying to win a world title. But then when when you ask the question, why is it that in this dude's 21 year career, he only has four NBA championships? And then they was like, well, you know, look at his numbers. Okay. Well, if that's the case, look, look at look at Javante Tank Davis. Javante Tank Davis is undefeated. Javante Tank Davis is a four divisional world champion. He's undefeated. He's a four divisional world champion. Does that make Javante Tank Davis greater than Roberto Duran? I mean, th- does that make him, you, you know, like there's people with fewer fights than, than, than Tank. I mean, think think about it like this. Terrence Crawford is undisputed in the welterweight and and the and 140. Does that make Terrence Crawford greater than Roberto Duran? Does that make Terrence Crawford greater than d- does that make him greater than like what? Sugar Shane Mosley? Does, does that make Terrence Crawford like, like, think about this for a second. Think about all of the great welterweights. Think about all of the great welterweights like Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker. Is Terrence Crawford greater than Sweet Pea? Pernell Whitaker was champion at what, 135? He was champion at like I believe 140. He was champion at 147. He was champion at 154. But went back down to 147, finished his career at 147. But Terrence Crawford, man, you know, won world champion. Think about Canelo Alvarez. Canelo Alvarez was undisputed at 168. There was a reporter that says Canelo was the greatest super middleweight of all time. Canelo Alvarez, just because he became undisputed at 168, that makes him greater than Andre Ward. That makes him greater than Joe Calzaghe. That made him better, than, greater than Roy Jones. I mean, because because we're talking about statistics here. We're talking about stats here. You can't go off numbers. You can't go off. You, you can't. And, and, and like I say, you have you have fighters and NBA players who pad their stats. 
so that y- you can be under the impression that boxing is comparable, maybe even better than boxing was back in the day. And so is, is that the case? Is that the case? How many how many times was Joe Frazier world champion? Joe Frazier was world champion. He he uh, he lost to Ali. I, I, I want to say Joe Frazier was just champion. Maybe just once. I don't think he was champion more than once. I don't think he was. I know he he beat Muhammad Ali and then he lost to Muhammad Ali. But then I think um, he beat Muhammad Ali. Then then I think he ended up losing to Joe Frazier. I mean, to George Foreman. But Anthony Joshua is a two-time unified world heavyweight champion. Does that make Anthony Joshua greater than Joe Frazier? Huh. Wow. LeBron needed all the help, and he's not a clutch player like Jordan. You said Broner man had so much potential if only he took boxing more seriously. Yeah, man, and, and it's like that's the narrative with LeBron. It's like LeBron need help. LeBron need help. That's what they've been saying for years, for over a decade. They've been saying that about LeBron. But, but man, the, the fact that LeBron James needed to go, because had LeBron James, had, had he not gone to the heat, would LeBron James have ever won an NBA title? People got to ask themselves that question. I was asking, I was asking this dude that last week, I was like, like, let me ask you a question. I was like, so if LeBron had not gone to the Miami Heat, would LeBron have won an NBA title? And so you, you also got to think in this sense, Patrick Ewan stayed with the Knicks and a lot of these players stayed with the teams that they were with. Carl Malone stayed with the Utah Jazz until the Utah Jazz decided to trade him. But Carl Malone could have broke Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's record. He could have broke, just like Barry Sanders could have easily, easily broke Walter Payton's record. He was on pace to break Walter Payton's record. But he didn't want to. He He retired, you know. Carl Malone could have broke Kareem's record before LeBron did, but he retired. He he didn't want to. And, and, and so, and so I think Kobe also, Kobe could have also surpassed, uh, I think he could have also co- surpassed, uh, you know, I, I think Wilt or Kareem. He could have pa- he could have surpassed them, but he just chose not to. Co- Kobe was just like. Kobe, he said the, the 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 moment he decided to retire, he said he went to this one game and he said all, all those players whose jerseys were up on the up in the banners, and he was just like, Man, I played with these dudes. He said, All these dudes are long gone now. He's like, Man, it's about time for me to leave. Speaking of Joshua, I'm glad he knocked out Francis. Um yeah, me too, man. I'm I'm kind, you know, I'm I'm glad that people are no longer hyping up Francis and Gatto. But the bottom line is that Anthony Joshua fought Francis and Gatto because he was avoiding actual boxers. And so when you look at and, and so it reminds me of today's NBA. You know, it reminds me of this load management. You know, like a lot of people use load management because there are certain players and certain games that they don't want to play in. I remember, uh, like I remember, 
earlier this season, the Lakers were going to play. It, it, and this happened on a couple of occasions. The Lakers was was getting ready to play the Minnesota Timberwolves. And, and I'm telling you, that dude, uh, Edwards, is savage. And LeBron didn't want to play against him. And so LeBron claimed that he was hurt. LeBron James has this ankle injury that needed surgery, and it needed surgery. It needed surgery last year. It needed surgery last year. And 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 this dude still playing on this bad ankle. And every time LeBron James avoids smoke with other players, this ankle injury always flares up. This ankle injury that needs surgery. People always make the Jordan and LeBron comparison. I personally think Kobe was better. Man, let me tell you, man. I'm going to tell you like this. LeBron isn't even in my top 25. LeBron James isn't even in my top 25. And he's not in my top 25 because, I mean, it's like, I, I don't like, for so many reasons, for so many reasons, one of the main reasons is that, bro, they got a flop compilation of LeBron. They have a flop compilation of him. He gets away with traveling. He gets away with carrying. You know, he he doesn't have a signature move. His move is that he lowers his shoulders and he comes into the, comes into the hole and, 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 and because he's 6'8", 260, some of these, some of these younger dudes, these younger dudes who are kind of soft anyway, they won't contest him, you know. So he'll go in there uncontested. But if someone does, if someone does, you know, contest his shot, then he just draws the foul. But then, if he's not able to draw the foul, he'll flop. He'll flop, you know, he'll fake like he got fouled. So, and, and then, like I said, he carries, he travels, and uh, and, and then he hops from team to team. The, the rules have changed so much in, so much in the NBA. And, and when you think about it, um, these guys are not, they're not better athletes. And they're not better shooters. They're not better athletes. They're not better shooters. You know, it, it, it appears that they're just like it appears that they're better dribblers because they're be- better ball handlers because the NBA is letting them get away with carrying. These guys appear to be better shooters because they shoot they shoot uncontested three pointers. They shoot uncontested shots. And the NBA just isn't competitive anymore. The NBA is not for the fans and it's not for the owners. It's for the players. And uh, and going back to something I was saying earlier, uh, you know, the NBA, one of the reasons why the rules have changed so much to cater to these European players and Eastern European players One of the reasons why it's changed is because the NBA has expanded itself to the European market. So because they've expanded themselves to the European market, you know, and attracting more European players, it's it's getting more airtime from European broadcast. That's the that's the reason. You says former NBA player Gilbert uh, really gets on my nerves, man. He says today's NBA players are more skilled than before. So let me say this about Gilbert Arenas. I'm, I'm going to tell you this about Gilbert Arenas. And you could say the same thing about a lot of these boxers and boxing coaches and, and, and all types of stuff. But I'm going to tell you this. The reason why Gilbert Arenas – is going is saying this about today's NBA players. Number one, because Gilbert Arenas is getting paid to say it. If you if they weren't paying Gil, you got to remember Gilbert Arenas is getting hired by people, and he's getting hired by people to say these things about today's NBA. That's the first thing. So 
Gilbert Arenas, JJ Reddick, you know, those guys, they are getting even even when you think about someone like Scotty Pippen, when when you when you think as when you think of these different dudes, when you think about these different guys, they're getting paid to say this stuff about the NBA. So if so if the NBA so so if the NBA and clutch sports, clutch sports is another uh, entity that that is that they're paying people to say this stuff. Because you have that, that's the first thing. The second thing, and, and this is going to be harsh, this is going to be really harsh. But the reason why Gilbert Arenas is saying is making the argument, making a statement that Michael Jordan, uh, that LeBron James is greater than Michael Jordan, that LeBron James is greater than Kobe, is because no one's saying that Gilbert Arenas is the greatest. No one's saying him. No one's talking about Agent Zero. No one's talking about him. That's the reason why Gilbert Arenas is saying those things. He's saying those things because no one is talking about him. They're talking about they're talking about Kobe. They're talking about Dr. J. They're talking about the NBA in the 80s, the NBA in the 90s. They're talking about the NBA in the early 2000s. They are they're they're not they're not talking about Gilbert and they're not talking about Gilbert Arenas. Gilbert Arenas played for the Washington Wizards at the tail end of Michael Jordan's tenure there as like the, the vice president of basketball operations. Michael Jordan played for the Wizards. And the only reason why he played for the Wizards was because he wanted to show this, he wanted to show this team what it took in order for you to 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 be a champion. Michael Jordan took a lot of the stuff that he was doing as a Chicago Bull and he was bringing it to the Wizards. And the problem was, is that this is when it first began with a lot of these players acting very entitled. And so that's one of the reasons why Michael Jordan was saying, I can never be a coach. I can never be a coach because I'm not patient. Those dudes test your patience, their entitledness, their laziness. Because, you know, like a lot of these NBA players, man, like you got to think about it like this. Think about it your entire life. People been telling you, you the man. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go to the NBA, man, and these dudes, you know, and they're just, they they, they they just treating you, you know, like a jag, you know, just another guy. They're treating you like a jag. And, and so imagine that. Imagine that, if you will. It's like those dudes didn't like Michael Jordan treating them like that. And, and it, it could have been Gilbert Arenas, too. Gilbert Arenas could have been one of those dudes where Michael Jordan was treating him like a jag, just another guy. And Gilbert Arenas didn't like that. Gilbert Arenas had some moments where he scored like 60 points. whoop de doo Good for you, Gilbert. Good for you. Gilbert Arenas had, had, a, had a period where he was arguably one of the best players in the NBA. Good for you. But Gilbert Arenas was was one of the best players in the NBA for a very short period of time. Kobe Bryant was one of the best NBA players for a very long time. Most of Kobe Bryant's career, the majority of Kobe Bryant's career, Kobe Bryant was arguably the best player in the NBA. Michael Jordan from the time Michael Jordan got in the league to the time Michael Jordan got out of the league, Michael Jordan was the greatest player in the NBA. Michael Jordan completely dominated the 90s. He dominated the 90s. And you talk this Michael Jordan is not a center. Typically in the NBA, a center is who dominates. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Wilt Chamberlain, typically George Mikan. Typically, a center dominates. Akeem Olajuwon, typically a center dominates. Michael Jordan wrote the blueprint of a guard dominating. 
and, and Jordan dominated throughout the entire 90s. He dominated. And if it wasn't a center, it was a power forward. It was a forward. It was an Elgin Baylor. It was a Carl Malone. It was a Tim Duncan. It was typically a center. It was typically a big man that was dominating. Michael Jordan dominate. And, and, and not only did Michael Jordan dominate, Michael Jordan was feared. He was feared. Chuck Distance, my main man. We're in the building. I can see that, man. Jordan will go off on teammates that slacks off. Yep. You just change your toilet, fill valve, and flapper. But Jordan dominated. And think about it like this. So Jordan was already scoring champion, MVP. He was he was uh, he was uh score he was a scoring champion. This one year he was scoring champion. He was scoring champion and he was defensive player of the year. So he was shutting you down and he was scoring on you at will. Right? Michael Jordan in the when you think about Michael Jordan's career. Now it, it would tell you that Michael Jordan had a 15 year career. When you really think about it, Michael Jordan really, in, 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 in actuality, Michael Jordan probably played a total of about 11, 12 years. He 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 played a total of like 11 to 12 years. So in 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 the 11, 12 years he played, where he played complete seasons, Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan for 10 of those seasons was scoring champion, won the scoring title. But then how many times was Michael Jordan all defensive? How many times was Michael Jordan defensive player of the year? My, like Michael Jordan would like Michael Jordan at one point had the most blocks in the history of the NBA for a guard. Michael Jordan was leading the NBA in steals. Like Michael Jordan, like y'all got to think about like what this dude did in such a short period of time. Then not to mention in the 90s, you had the you had the 91, 92, 93 bit Bulls. So you had the you had the 90, 91 Bulls, the 90, 92 Bulls. I mean, the 91, 92 Bulls. The, uh, and what was it 93, 94, some, something like that, like but Jordan, and then he took two, he took two years off, came back and three-peated again. So, and then the last two years, he left because he just retired. He didn't have anything else to prove. So it was like on two different occasions. So it, it was nothing else left to prove. LeBron is still trying to prove himself. LeBron is still trying to prove himself. And then to make it so bad, this joker comes into the NBA. What number did LeBron wear? What number did LeBron wear when he came into the NBA? This this Negro going to say Allen Iverson was, a, was the most influential person to him. However, this, this same joker came in wearing number 23 and was wearing number 23 his entire career as a, as a basketball, as a, a uh, high school player. As a high school player, LeBron was wearing number 23, but he says that Allen Iverson was his greatest inspiration. Man, please. Man, please. Why why did Kobe wear, wear 24? Why did Kobe wear 24? Because Jordan was the standard. He wore 24 because Jordan was the standard. I'm trying to be better than Mike. Kobe Bryant emulated who when he was playing? Who did he emulate?
Jordan had the NBA players on lock. All the players looked up to him regardless of what they may say now. Dude, if y'all didn't see this, take a look at this uh, All-75 team. and Take a look at this All-75 team and look at how the players reacted and you talking about like old dudes. You talk about old players. Dr. J, Magic Johnson. You talking about like first ballot Hall of Famers. Look at how they reacted when Mike walked in. Michael Jordan, first of all, Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan is an alpha. Like Michael Jordan is a straight up alpha. LeBron isn't. LeBron tries to LeBron wants to be people's friends. You know, Mike was built different. Kobe was built different. They people dreaded Mike and Kobe. They dreaded playing against them. Because those dudes were killers. Those dudes were killers. And like I said, with Mike, Mike set the standard. Like, like Mike as a guard dominated the NBA. Mike was feared. He was feared by everybody. Bro, Shaquille O'Neal said he feared Jordan. Akeem Olajuwon feared Jordan. Patrick Ewan feared Jordan. Okay. And then let me let me just let me just cook on Isaiah Thomas right quick. I'm gonna tell you the truth about Isaiah Thomas. Why Isaiah Thomas hates Michael Jordan so much? The reason why Isaiah Thomas hates Michael Jordan is that first of all, Isaiah Thomas is from Chicago. Okay, he's from Chicago, and Chicagoans give Michael Jordan more love than they give Isaiah Thomas. That's the first thing. Isaiah Thomas, I'm going to say this again. Isaiah Thomas is from Chicago. However, Chicagoans give Michael Jordan more love and respect and appreciation than they give Isaiah. Isaiah Thomas attended the University of Indiana. Okay, Isaiah Thomas attended. I'm going to get up close so you you guys can hear this real good. Isaiah Thomas attended Indiana University, okay? He attended Indiana University where he played for Coach Bobby Knight. Coach Bobby Knight, during the 80, when he coached the 84 Olympic team, Bobby Knight says that Michael Jordan was the greatest player and the greatest athlete he has ever coached. Isaiah Thomas at this point was playing for the Detroit Pistons. Bobby Knight, Isaiah Thomas's former coach, said that Michael Jordan was not only the greatest athlete he's ever coached, but the greatest player he's ever coached. Meaning that in Bobby Knight's opinion, Michael Jordan was a far superior basketball player, not just athlete, but superior basketball player to Isaiah Thomas. Okay? One other thing. One other, a couple of other things. Isaiah Thomas didn't get chosen for the dream team because... Not only did the dream team not want him, but it's also safe to say the coach of the dream team, Chuck Daly, which was Isaiah Thomas's coach when he was at with the Detroit Pistons, didn't want Isaiah on that team. See, y'all got to remember, Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer, Rick Mahorn, uh, what was it, Dennis? I think it was Dennis Edwards. Let, let, let me make sure that was his name. Let me make sure that was his name.
Yeah, James Edwards. So, so look, so check this out. Bill Lambeer, James Edwards, and um, and then Isaiah Thomas and Rick Mahorn. Those dudes, and this is why Charles Barkley didn't like the Pistons. Those dudes, when they fouled you, they were trying to end your career. They were they were not just trying to foul you. They were trying to injure you. Right? Let me let me see what these let me see what I'm, so let me see uh Ewing will have won a ring in another timeline outside of Jordan. Exactly. Yeah. The Knicks made him the front man. Yep. John Starks, Allen Houston couldn't deliver. Uh, Jordan supposedly shut Isaiah Thomas's, Thomas down from the dream team. Uh, it was one or, or the other. It says the NBA needed a face. They even tried to force LeBron down our throat. Woo-wee! Kendrick Taylor. It didn't work. Rather, it's boxing or, or NBA. The fighter or player has to be born, not created. Oh, and, and, and see, look, Michael Jordan said this. He says, you cannot fool the c- consumer. You cannot fool the consumer. With Michael Jordan... Dr. J, Larry Bird, and even Isaiah Thomas with Kevin McHale. I listen, I don't think LeBron is I don't even think like I don't even think LeBron LeBron is nowhere near better than Kevin McHale or Larry Bird. In my opinion. It's it's not even close. But Rick Mahorn still a bad boy to this day. Yep. Canelo and LeBron know they'll never be the face. Yep. Yep. So so look, let, let me tell you this. So those dudes with the Detroit Pistons, they were trying to end your career. Isaiah Thomas, they were trying to hurt you. They what they would do, they and they did the same thing to Scottie Pippen. They were putting they they were they were bumping knees with Scottie Pippen. They they were pulling down Michael Jordan really hard, you know, trying you know trying to hurt him when Michael Jordan was driving to the hole, you know, like they they were they were trying to hurt these guys, and and so and then Isaiah Thomas, you guys also have to remember what Isaiah Thomas. Here's here's an interesting story. I'm gonna put up pull it up closer. Here's another interesting story about Isaiah Thomas. The Pistons had remember they had Adrian Dantley. Adrian Dantley they got Adrian Dantley from the Utah Jazz. Adrian Dantley was a former scoring champion. Adrian Dantley really should be like one of the on the all time great list with with the you know, NBA all time greats. But Adrian Dantley. Isaiah Thomas wanted to be the man at the Pistons. And so Isaiah Thomas started this thing where he didn't want to give Adrian Dantley the ball. But when Adrian Dantley got the ball, the the the, the they were they were highly effective. The only thing that hurt Adrian Dantley was that Adrian Dantley had got a real bad ankle injury and after that ankle injury, he he ended up getting traded. And he got traded because it was Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas, man, Isaiah Thomas has a reputation for for basically being a snake. Isaiah Thomas is one of those dudes who will say good things about you and then he and then he'll talk real bad about you. Because the rumor was with Isaiah Thomas that Isaiah Thomas was spreading these gay rumors around about Magic Johnson. So and, and, and so then, you know, and so Isaiah Thomas, Isaiah Thomas is saying these things about Michael Jordan because the the one memory that people have about Isaiah Thomas is that the bad boy Pistons, when they lost to the Bulls, they walked off the court. 
And so then Isaiah Thomas tried to throw Larry Bird under the bus. He says, well, when we beat the Celtics, the Celtics just walked off the court. They didn't shake hands with us. He said, then he, then he, he changed the story. He said, well, it was a tradition that you just congratulated the team in the locker room. But then, but then he, he, he like changed, he kept changing the story. So Isaiah Thomas has a reputation of being dirty. He has a reputation of being a, a bad sportsman. And then Isaiah Thomas has a bad reputation of screwing up team chemistry. And so because of that, you know, they didn't want to play with Isaiah. Larry Bird did not like the Pistons because of Larry Bird's history with the Pistons. Remember what Isaiah Thomas said about Larry Bird. Had Larry Bird been black, he would just been a regular player. Remember, like all of these things that Isaiah Thomas said about Scottie Pippen continues to say about Scottie Pippen. All of these things Isaiah Thomas did and said about John Stockton did. And, uh, remember, Isaiah Thomas had beef with Karl Malone. Remember, Karl Malone elbowed Isaiah Thomas. So you got to remember all of these people who had beef with Isaiah Thomas. That's the reason why Isaiah Thomas wasn't on the dream team. Isaiah Thomas was not liked by NBA players. He was not liked. He was not likable. That's why Isaiah Thomas wasn't on the dream team. And Isaiah Thomas is using Michael Jordan as a scapegoat because again the truth is people charles barkley remember man, i remember charles barkley saying bleep the detroit pistons Char charles barkley couldn't stand the pistons charles barkley was one of the few people who would fight rick mahorn but uh, again man like these are like People forget. And it's crazy how all of that stuff just came back to my memory. It's crazy. That's the reason why Isaiah Thomas hates Michael Jordan. He tries to say, you know, Michael Jordan called me an a-hole. <sighs> The entire dream team, including your coach, did not want you on that team. And I just I just gave you all the reasons why they didn't want him on the team. They didn't want him on the team because of Isaiah. I, I, Isaiah, man, he's Isaiah burnt bridges, man. He burnt bridges. Yeah, Barkley was real tough in his playing days. He was real tough. But, <clears throat> yeah, man. And then the Pistons, the Pistons even tried to change the narrative that the reason why they lost to the Bulls was because they were old. But think about it like this. All right, so... When you look at the when you look at the Pistons, so you look at them in 1991, the Detroit Pistons in 1991, Isaiah, Joe Dumars. So so I'm, I'm gonna look I'm gonna look at this. Um, Joe Dumars was still Joe Dumars was about 28, 27, 28. Yeah, Joe Dumars was probably like when they lost to the Bulls, Joe Dumars was like 28. Um Dennis Rodman was about 30. Isaiah Thomas was 30. So so the you know well Isaiah Thomas was like 29 30 years old. So so these dudes these dudes weren't old. They tried to make it seem like they were all all old and washed up. They weren't old and washed up. The, 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 like I I think one of the oldest players 
was maybe um I want to say maybe like uh Bill I know Bill Lambeer Bill Lambeer was was like in his mid mid 30s about 34 um I think uh Tree Rollins was a little bit older than Bill Lambeer and then James Edwards was also James Edwards was also like in 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 his 30s but you know other than uh, you know he, Edwards was like in his mid 30s but it's like other than that that when the Detroit Pistons lost to the Bulls in the Eastern Conference Finals the, the Pistons were not old they were not old it's just that the Bulls got better so yeah, man, it's it's like so. <clears throat> all these narratives that's out there, all, all of these things, man, that people are doing, uh, you know, trying trying to make it seem as if, you know, Jordan won all that, man. It's it's like nah, like nah, we we not doing that. We not playing that game. Anyway, guys, um, let me get on out of here, man. Let me get on out of here. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Holler at you guys later. Peace.